Welcome to London and this brand new weekly show from Greenpeace. I'm Sophie Duker. And I'm Simon Watt. And this is Ocean Witness. I love the studio. It's like a sort of nautical bunker. Yeah, we uh, might well need some of this if the show suddenly starts to sink. That is true. So, this series follows a year-long voyage from pole to pole. Greenpeace ships Arctic Sunrise and Esperanza have been on quite the journey over the past year, as my lovely assistant will now demonstrate. So, last April, the Esperanza headed north to the Fram Strait, where it was joined by the Arctic Sunrise, and then both ships went all the way down to Antarctica, where they still are now. And now through the magical wonders of technology, ta-da! This is actual webcam footage from onboard Arctic Sunrise. Uh, it might not look might much right now, but it was taken a few hours ago from actually onboard the ship. Uh, the next one is from Esperanza. Marginally uh, fairer weather on board the Esperanza. And by the look of where the way that horizon's going, we can tell that right now, at least a few of the people are feeling a bit seasick. So both ships have been in Antarctica now for just over a month. And we've just received some really exciting footage. We came out and launched the boat because we saw about, looked like about five or six whales from the bridge. Ah, uh, look, there it is, just off the bow. And we were hoping to get an ID shot, so a, a photograph of the tail fluke as the whales are diving for each of those individuals. But then we managed to catch up with the group that were sort of socialising at the surface. We approached them, we turned the engine off, and two whales just came and spent about 20 minutes just cruising around, um, passing by the rib, going under the rib, spy hopping. Tim was able to get the hydrophone out, so we've been photographing them, filming them, and listening to them. Underneath the boat. at these guys are incredibly lucky they're so so close up they didn't intend this they didn't want to come here the Greenpeace have got very strict protocols they know that you don't go and bother the whales you don't get up close and personal but if they come to you and these are intelligent social animals so chances are that they're coming to have a look they're curious oh and this is a beautiful behavior what we call spy hopping so they're poking the big nose up above the water trying to get their eyes out of the water so they can look Literally, these people are looking at the whale, and it's looking back. They're very dainty about it. They're quite coy, just sort of peeking. Sadly, it's not all exciting close-up whale activity. We've also had some bad news from Antarctica this week. Some scientists have recorded the hottest ever temperature in Antarctica of 18.3 degrees Celsius. At one of the bases, we can see some sad penguins in the sun. But that's not the only bad news for penguins this week. A report published by Greenpeace has shown how some numbers of chinstrap penguins have been declining up to 77% in Antarctica compared to what they were 50 years ago. We'll be bringing you lots more updates from Antarctica for the rest of the series. 
But now it's time to cast our minds back to 10 months ago when Arctic Sunrise and Esperanza were at the other end of the globe in the Arctic Ocean. Right now we're on this ship, the Greenpeace Esperanza, in the high Arctic off the coast of Svalbard, 79 degrees north. <laughs> Dismiss. <laughs> uh, so we are on the bridge. This is where we control the ship for the navigation. We are now getting to the edge of the of the ice. So from here north there is no more water, it's all ice. Because it's so challenging and in some ways also dangerous to be out here, research in the Arctic is only a fairly recent uh, enterprise for, for humans. We've only been doing actively science here maybe for the last hundred years or so. And it's still very unknown. A lot of the very fundamental aspects of how the ecosystem functions are not very well understood. We are now joined in the studio by science writer Olive Heffernan and Greenpeace's Head of Oceans, Will McCallum. Hi. Hi. Welcome. So, Olive, you joined Greenpeace's expedition. You've been to both poles. Why are you out there on the oceans? Well, I'm a freelance science journalist um, and I'm writing a book about the oceans at the moment. So um, the focus of my book is on the high seas, which is the half of the planet that is ocean belonging to no one. And the book that I'm writing basically explores our relationship with this half of the planet and looks at our sort of ongoing struggle between our desire to exploit it and our desire um, to protect it. The Arctic was just sort of incredible because it felt really remote and wild and in some ways I hadn't expected that because the Arctic is populated and we know that it's being really impacted by climate change. But, you know, I just didn't see any sign of plastic pollution or any boats or any oil rigs or, you know, any sign that um, it was impacted in other ways, which, you know, possibly it is. But the, the sense of desolation and isolation of the Arctic was incredible. And then Antarctica, on the other hand, was just absolute chaos, like noisy <laughs> and smelly um, because we arrived there when it was peak breeding season for penguins. So that was mayhem. Very okay. different. Oh, that's you in the Arctic there? That's right, yeah. You think, yeah. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> hard to tell. anyone. Right? Yeah. Um, when you were on the ice floes with the scientists in the Arctic, um, what's that like? It sounds very intense to be in a small block of ice. Yeah, uh, possibly absolutely. The, threat of... the, the ice flow really just measures sort of several metres by several metres. And um, there were about 10 or 12 of us on an individual flow. We spent several hours out there taking ice cores, measuring the the width of the um, the depth or thickness, I suppose, of the ice flow itself. You're saying that it looks pristine, and, and sure enough, it does if things mm. are covered with snow, but obviously the scientists are there for a reason. What kind yeah. of thing have you learned from them? I suppose one of the things that I learned during um, my time in Fram Strait, which I hadn't sort of anticipated, was the importance of the sea ice algae. So, you know, I went to the Arctic all expecting big animals and really excited about whales and you know, walruses or polar bears. But actually, I suppose I came away with a real appreciation of the importance of these tiny algae. Um, so they basically live in the bottom of the ice flows, trapped in these little bubbles um, in the sea ice. So when the ice melts, they're released into the, into the water and other things like zooplankton come and feed on them. And if you look at the zooplankton under the microscope, as we did actually on Arctic sunrise, you can see that they have these little sacks of lipids these little oil sacs, and that's from feeding on these really nutritious algae. And so everything that then comes to Fram Strait comes there because it is literally a veritable feast in springtime. And so if the sea ice disappears, the sea ice algae disappear, and then you've lost the most nutritious food source. 
Is it possible that the animals and the ecosystem in the Arctic are under threat from other things as well? So Greenpeace is really committed to protecting 30% of all oceans, but particularly the Arctic. What's going to happen if the sea ice melts in terms of human uh, interference, in terms of mm. people going up to the Arctic yeah, and fishing? Yeah, I mean, right now, Fram Strait is still, you know, relatively frozen for much of the year and you know historically it's always been this kind of area where it's been packed with with sea ice but obviously if the sea ice vanishes which could happen you know within decades within 20 or 30 years according to scientific predictions it could become a sea route um, mm. up to the arctic ocean and i think as the sea ice retreats people are becoming interested in all sorts of potential resources, whether they're the resources of the seabed, maybe minerals, or you know, they're interested in the possibility of oil and gas. Um, and then obviously, Fram Strait itself would be more impacted by shipping and with the associated pollution that goes along with shipping. Yeah, if it melts, it's going to snowball, although it'll be a melting snowball, as we can tell. <laughs> uh, well, as the head of the oceans for Greenpeace, not, not in general, I'm not suggesting you're paying the high seas. Um, <laughs> Can you tell us actually in that case if half of the oceans are not owned as such or not like an area belonging to any country, how do we manage conservation in these areas? Well, the problem is at the moment we don't. It's just an afterthought and sometimes not even an afterthought. It's just not considered at all. So we propose this, this treaty, a global ocean treaty is what we've called it, and, and we've been working on it pretty much for the last 18, 19 years. And... About three years ago, the, the UN decided that it was going to move ahead into formal negotiations. So this is really the make or break point where, where they said the treaty is definitely going to happen. And so we decided, well, if it's definitely going to happen, we have to make it as strong as it possibly can. And when I say strong, I mean it has to have the power to actually put aside areas of the ocean and protect them, create ocean sanctuaries. So scientists say we need to protect about 30% by 2030. And to do that... Well, at the moment, the problem is we can't do that. Without a, without a treaty to manage these areas of ocean, we just can't protect them at the level that we need to. So we decided to, to launch a pole-to-pole -pole expedition where we travel down the ocean talking about the threats that the high seas are facing, but also showcasing the beauty and the wonder of the high seas. Because I think they're so far away from, from people's daily lives. You know, the, the high seas is anything more than 200 miles away from, from shore. So it's automatically out of sight, out of mind. And so we wanted to bring it into people's living rooms, into people's uh, social media and start telling that story of why we need to protect these places and also how we can protect them, which is, you know, ocean sanctuaries. So what you're saying is in order to have any sort of effective global action on this, we need the UN to sign off on a strong treaty. That's right. A strong treaty that is capable of putting humans, human activities off limits in a third of the world's oceans. Well, if we're saying human activities, it's pretty obvious to say climate change is coming that's going to affect the Arctic massively. What good is a treaty in that kind of case? So one of the things that we know about the ocean is that, that when you put it off limits to human activities, it, it re rebounds very quickly. So wildlife do much better. You find a lot more wildlife there, and that creates a healthier ocean. So in the face of something like climate change, uh, you know, putting these areas, yes, it doesn't solve climate change. You know, we need to, we need to phase out fossil fuels. We need to uh, stop having so many cars driving around if we want to solve climate change. But what it does do is make the ocean much more resilient to climate change. And so for somewhere like the Arctic that's changing so quickly, resilience really matters. You know, it really matters that it's, it's strong enough in the face of climate change. And that's what the treaty will help do. It will help make it more resilient. So for the next five weeks, your daily life is going to be joining this expedition, continuing in Antarctica. Yeah, so I'm going to go down and I'm going to join the Esperanza, uh, which Olive spent some time on. And it's, it's one of our biggest ships. It is our biggest ship, even. Uh, and it's an old Russian firefighting vessel. So it's, it's quite austere, lots of small dark corridors, quite like a maze inside. Uh, and we've sort of decked out as best we can with, with up-to-date research equipment. Thank you both so much, Olive, and good luck with the rest of the book. And Will, yeah. good luck not getting seasick out there. We're going to send us some videos. Absolutely, I'll send you a message. About. And now a little bit more information on the science happening on the Arctic expedition. This whole environment is formed around sea ice. Everything. Almost every single animal that lives here is here because of the ice. So we don't really know the, the repercussions of such a drastically changing environment 
physically, when the physical environment, when the temperatures and the ice changes, we don't really know how that is impacting the local ecosystem. And that's what we're trying to understand. And one thing that, that always happens is that one type of scientist comes out here. So we have a physicist trying to understand the sea ice, or we have a marine biologist trying to understand the behavior of the whale. But everything is very interconnected, and that's what we're trying to fill the gap in here, is trying to um, have uh, scientists of all disciplines working together and trying to piece this puzzle together. So right now we're here on a pretty small ice flow, a little bit in from the ice edge. We're um, at about almost 80 north and 4 degrees east, roughly, which means we're about 100 miles off the coast of Svalbard. We've measured the thickness of the ice in two perpendicular directions um, at every five meters and then also the depth of the snow because there's a little bit of snow here now. And then we've also taken two ice cores. And what we're trying to understand is A, where did this ice flow come from? And B, how old is it? And C, what are the creatures and nutrients that reside inside the ice flow? <laughs> you look at the ice surface that we're standing on it looks very white and some of the ice when we look at it and take it out as a core looks kind of blue and transparent but inside the ice actually live these microscopic algae this sea ice algae it's like a microscopic forest so if you start at the bottom of the food chain algae live under the ice right so if there's no ice then there will be less algae because there's less space so and if there's less food then you'll have less upper predators and so the scientists have now projected that by the 2100, which isn't too far away now, there might not be any summer sea ice in the Arctic at all, which means that now the Arctic Ocean will be an ocean without any ice. Not only do these upper predators rely on the food that's found in the water, but many of them rely on the ice for breeding, for mating, for living, like if you think of a polar bear, they live on the ice and so um, really every level of the food chain would be affected in some way if not directly indirectly by um, the loss of ice. Us gaining a deeper understanding of the processes here will help us to make more informed decisions about what may happen in the Arctic in the future and so we hope to provide that fundamental knowledge um, that others might use to make good decisions. Now we're going to take a look at something really incredible that happened during the expedition behind the scenes of the world's most northerly ice concert. What's an ice concert, you might ask? Well, you're about to find out. Like, let yourself go a little bit and then hear it and then realize what you're hearing is ice. My name is Bill Kovitz. I come from uh, Cheshire, Connecticut in the United States and I've uh, been carving ice for 22 years now. For me as an ice carver to really enjoy an ice concert, you want it cold. At, you know, minus 20, minus, uh, minus 20 is fantastic get past there yes it gets cold for everybody you know but but minus 20 the ice sings the the resonance how long sound you know it continues to vibrate and it just sings I mean ice sings creating instruments out of pure nature I find it uh, very meaningful to do that my name is Tadia Isingset. I come from Norway. All my life I've been doing music. A horn that I'm making, it's a wal walrus uh, tusk horn. 
that I'm, I'm preparing for the concert, but this ice um, has come from the glacier. So I can't put a date on it, but just imagine how old this ice possibly could be. This ice might be 1,000 year old, it might be 100,000 year old. And the transparent ice is the oldest ice because it's, it's really underneath and it's pressed out to the ocean, out to the sea. And that's the sound we will hear. We're fighting the weather so, so much. We're trying to save as much in, in the freezers as possible here in, in Svalbard in the Arctic. And uh, we're having to use chest freezers to save small pieces. And um, as we're carving it, it's just kind of falling apart. And everything we carve, it sits for half an hour and it falls apart. So the uh, best bet is just bringing more ice on, lots of it, and hopefully uh, we get some cold weather. And we just threw the entire concert overboard and had to start from scratch again. And I'd say it's heartbreaking, you know, it's really bad. We're fighting these conditions that we shouldn't be fighting here. And so if nothing else, I hope we're proving a point here, you know, through our suffering and, you know, the world should be suffering with us. I never thought you need a freezer in the Arctic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> To be here in this location is absolutely fantastic. And the fact that we harvest the ice here and we make the instruments and we actually perform here. To be on Svalbard in that fjord and play music on ice instruments and when you're surrounded by this uh, it's a once in a lifetime experience. You sort of speak um, a language from the nature. Uh, it's the nature sounds and we bring them to a human language which people understand. There are lots of uh, water on, on the planet, on, also even in our bodies. It's an important part of our life, is the ocean. And if the ocean doesn't, I mean, if the ocean doesn't thrive, then we don't thrive. Maybe human beings don't see the problems with the ocean because it's not in our garden, to say so. So I think um, in general that it's very important that we treat uh, nature with respect and gentle. Um, also the ice instruments, we have to treat them very gentle, otherwise they break. I broke a lot of ice sticks <laughs> during the, the process, because you had to be very careful in the playing. So the fact that you make instruments out of ice and you kind of just, when you're done with it, it's ice, so it will go back into nature and it's kind of a part of nature. The nature can give us more than what we can see. It can give us sounds and it can give us um, very much beauty. And that's what I think all this project is about, showing the world all the beautiful things that are in the ocean. sailing off into the distance is one of the saddest shots I've ever seen. Yeah. It's so, like, poignant. The music returns to the waves. Well, when they told me I was going to be listening to Ice Cube's newest tracks, I was expecting something a bit more hip-hop. Oh my God, Simon! You can enjoy the rest of the concert at the end of the show. Anyway, after those terrible puns, uh, we'd like to introduce you to our latest segment, which is Life on Board. This week we thought we'd let you get your bearings of a ship tour. And our guide? None other than star of Big Little Lies, Shailene Woodley. Shailene joined the expedition in August as the Esperanza travelled across the Sargasso Sea. What's up? 
I'm Shailene Woodley and I am an actor. I chose to join Greenpeace on this expedition because late last year I made a commitment to myself that I was going to spend 2019 learning about the ocean. When we're out here right now in the middle of the Sargasso Sea and you look over the edge of the boat and not only do you see giant pieces of macro plastic, plastic bags, plastic crates, old buoys, rope, line passing by. We're collecting thousands of teeny tiny little pieces of microplastic. This is the bridge where everybody does their navigating and keeps the ship on course. So this is the poop deck. This is where everybody poops. It's not as smelly as you think it would be. This is a big guy. Don't know what he does. I wasn't lying. It's actually called the poop deck. It's gonna get loud because we're going past the engine rooms. Down that door is the gym and the laundry room which is very hot and sweaty. That's the galley where our amazing chef and his sous chef cook meals twice a day for the entire crew of 33 people and do all the dishes. I don't, they have the hardest job on the whole ship, I think. This is the mess room where we all grind. One of my favorite places because that's where the food is. This is our luxurious suite that is very messy. Um, Ignore the mess, but check it out. It's kind of, it's my favorite place on the boat in a lot of ways, because it feels like home. We've got our couch, our workstation, and our beds. And we just sit down here at the end of the night and we talk like this. I was probably one years old when this was taken. The amount of humans that have dedicated their lives to social environmental justice is so beautiful. We're focusing on one particular body of water in this week that I'm here, and studying a lot about this body of water has allowed me to understand ocean ecosystems a lot better. It has allowed me to understand how policy truly needs to change internationally to not only just protect the Sargasso Sea, but all seas. <laughs>
That's all we've got for you this week. But before we wave you goodbye, don't forget this call to action. We need to put pressure on governments around the world to sign up to a strong global ocean treaty at the UN. Check out the links below or above this video to find out how you can get involved. Join us next week on Ocean Witness, same time, same place, for a celebration of all things testudinal. Say what? It's uh, Turtle Week. Oh, I thought it was about time you came out of your shell. Oh, any excuse to crack a few puns? But for now, let's relax, sit back and enjoy the otherworldly sights and sounds of the ice concert in full. Bye! Bye.